Nathan. Yep. Isn't there something? <laughs> I don't think so. No? No. Yeah. It's probably just my brain being like, maybe there's something. It's important. All right. Take it away. Uh, <laughs> okay. The Anthropocene Reviewed by John Green. Oh, uh, no additions to comment. Uh, uh, spoilers. We were afraid of oh. like, doing things like this live with spoilers. Right. People popping in. Like, right. Hey. So. <laughs> Heaven forbid we spoil the history and statistics of mankind. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the reviews would be a spoiler. Yes, you don't want anyone to know true. what final out of st- five stars things got. True. The st- it would really ruin everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll say right up front. Should have stuck with the, the five stars. Half star systems, terrible. <laughs> Although, yeah. you know, it gives a, it, it does technically double it to being what, a 10? Exactly. 10 out of 10. So, but it may be a little bit easier for us to wrap our mind around because there's less, there's just less things. I don't know. I don't know. To be fair, I was I was spoiled by the old X Play TV show, which I don't know if any of you would even be familiar with. Uh, I've heard of X Play. Yeah. So it was video game reviews, and they gave five out of five stars, and that's it. One to five, no half stars, and particularly that most things should get three stars because most things, at least in really publicly released video games, this is before this is like 2005, so early access like you mm-hmm. now have is not a thing. Mm-hmm. Everything should work. Everything should be basically functional. Everything should have not major obvious flaws. So most things get a three, and then things that stand out get fours and fives, and things that have, like, bad mechanics, bad design, bad writing, yada yada, you start dropping down. They did have to zero-star big rigs over the road trucking. (laughs) But if you know what that is, you understand what I just said. Don't. I can only imagine. It's a, it, that's How a, bad can it be? It's a racing game. The AI was not capable of pushing the gas. <laughs> there was no collision, okay. so you could drive okay. through buildings. That's... There was no gravity, so you could drive up walls and off the map. Uh... There was a, a course where you drove across a bridge, except you didn't drive through the bridge because there was no collision. You drove down the valley and up the valley <laughs> on the other side. There was no maximum speed in reverse. I, I give that at least two stars. That's amazing. <laughs> Because we are agents of chaos, yeah. Uh, oh, yes. uh, no, no, you wouldn't, Emily, because when you finish the course, it would understand that you finished the course, and it would say, it would put the trophy up with, Y-O-U-R, your winner. Oh, no. no. Zero stars, Zero stars <laughs> no. There we go. Oh, that's Something like for everyone. <laughs> winning a losing. How is oh, it so man. offensive across so many different spectrums, <laughs> so many different types of gamers and people? That's, I mean, truly impressive. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, oh, boy. Community. <laughs> that's wow. my complaint about half star systems in general. Not, not a really a problem with the book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that, that's actually that's an interesting perspective on it. I never really considered the. Uh, the maximum or the minimum when it comes to the necessary stars or, or rating system. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a better system in my opinion than like the, like the grading scale from A to F where like A, B, A's, A, B, and C are passing. Then you have these other ones that like, it, oh, percentage wise, I mean, so like an A is like mm-hmm. 90 to hundred B is 80 to 90 C is 72 or six, 70 to 80. Uh, and then so everything, you can't even remember. I know, <laughs> yeah. like everything underneath that is technically not passing. It's like, that's a lot of Ethan, percentage. Don't forget, you're giving me flashbacks to being in school. No, <laughs> go back to I, the numbers. I, like, I'm thinking <laughs> yeah. to myself, I'd, I would have rather had four stars on an essay than a uh, high B or whatever. Yeah. I mean, affirmations are important. I do think <laughs> that that's good. And that one particularly also shows up in video games because like the scale of most video game reviews that go to 10 points, like. Seven is their average review, mm-hmm. fundamentally. Which yep. there's a whole TV Tropes article called the Four Point Scale, which you should definitely read if you. Four but then you have to read TV Tropes, and you'll be stuck in there for like six hours. So don't do that. <laughs> Four points. Scale. Also, I'm going to link that in chat. Okay, by the way. Okay, perfect. <laughs> well, that's a good idea. Anything that comes up, we should do that. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, overall, I'd say that I really enjoyed the book at. I read a lot of essays in school and I love short story books. Uh, 
And it kind of felt like that. Like it felt like I could just pick it up and read it anywhere or I could just read through. I, I think I wound up just reading straight through so I wouldn't lose my way because uh, somehow I'd miss like one story. Uh huh. Well, there are a number of them that are clearly intentionally like structured in a row. True. Like, uh, True. Some of them are, some of them not so much, but like, what was the one I was thinking? Well, of? No, recently like towards one. the end, we kind of, there was a chain of them that I felt were very connected. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I think you could absolutely bounce around because they all have so much merit on their own, but the, it, it was, I read it sequentially as well. And I think that's a good way to go. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sweet. Yeah. I I'll particularly pull out the internet and uh, academic decathlon because in both yeah. cases, it's way it's this interaction with this bigger system that's kind of mentally overwhelming. Mm. And he's got like a social life on both of these, but the social life of the internet is like such a mess because internet and we're all here on the internet right now and we don't <laughs> need to have the full explanation right this second. But then that he academic decathlon where he actually got to spend a lot of time and a lot of uh, a lot of time with these people that he liked so it's he gets That's to give the point. much lower star to the thing that is the the weaker substitute for the better thing to that he immediately follows it up with yeah, that's a good link i I didn't really look at it that way when I read through those two, but they definitely felt comfortable to read one after the other that's a good yeah yeah i uh I feel like this. Well, obviously this book is really recent. So having saying like this came to me at such a perfect time in my life is kind of a funny thing to say with it being written and released so recently, but moving to a very close part of the, of the country geographically to where the author was based and having mm. so many things sort of in his, in his close range view mm. was really interesting. So I know a sequence I really liked just for me being new to Kentucky, having been to Indianapolis briefly uh, was there was like, Kentucky bluegrass and then Indianapolis got a rating and then the Indianapolis 500 and uh, the, his perspective on those things was great. And I, he does a really, really wonderful job. I think of there's like a microcosm and a macrocosm. There'll be this beautiful, like bring it down to something really close and personal and very human that we can grasp and then blowing it back out to even universal scale at times. And I liked that kind of shift in and out. And I think I also appreciated how easy he made me laugh or cry, or, I mean, my jaw just hit the floor so many times. Like, there's no way that statistic is correct. Bull, <laughs> there's a lot of that, <laughs> a lot of being like, Marlon, you have to hear this thing I just read. It's wild. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And I do think the chapter that got me the most fired up was the Kentucky Bluegrass one, though, um, mm -hmm. which is just because I, I so detest uh, Americana and, I guess, international lawn culture. So it really, it, like, gave me a lot of passion to uh, do what I've been planning and convert our front yard to a garden and have it be edible. Um, Yay. And maybe I'll have a groundhog to have a war with have a cool <laughs> groundhog garden. And that will be wonderful. I, yes, personally for me, it's rabbits. Fancy oh, that. Yes. Oh, uh, yes, they, understand. they tear up my stone pads. I, I it's amazing. They, they will dig underneath on the oh. side and then it will all crumble <laughs> away. It's like, amazing. How but big are these rabbits? <laughs> Yeah, there's usually like little uh, new holes and covered up very badly. And I'm like, a squirrel just put a nut in there. <laughs> They're working so, together. Oh, no. Uh -huh. It's bad. And so when I see hawks or coyotes, it's like, well, <laughs> nature. <laughs> nature. Well, but yeah, good luck is what I can yes. say. You will find someone in nature to argue with out there. <laughs> I'm guessing it will be a neighbor who's doesn't understand that we don't have an HOA so we can do whatever we want with our front yard. Uh, but <laughs> that will be the battle potentially, but I will forge ahead in our, not. in our Kentucky bluegrass fields, Kentucky neighborhood. And uh, yes, try to fight. Feel don't take inspired. any notes you find on your fence personally. That's uh, <laughs> my advice. I'm hoping I can bribe humans with vegetables and produce. This as will long be as they, come, they don't come in the form of severed heads on a pike, it's yes. fine. That's That'd be, yeah, I would say face, anything though. up to, but not including that would be, you know, within workable range. Severed arms. <laughs> Severed arms would be fine. Yeah. Rabbits. <laughs> Rabbits. <laughs> That's not what I said when I asked for compost. Thank you, makers. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, no. uh, anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I thought it was really accessible as a yeah. book. Because we can just pick it up anytime and not feel like we've it's been too long. That was nice. 
Um, Any specific facts or chapters that stood out to you guys? That, was there something that you, you read and went, oh my gosh, that's amazing, or that's insane, or I can't believe we do things this way? It's something that was really, that gravitated towards you? Mostly for me, it was a very meandering read and only occasionally it was just like and then I think that helped because if you're reading a book where every single sentence stands out it's almost exhausting like oh oh I gotta write that down and this one was a lot more comfortable um but uh here are some quotes I liked and so our image of velociraptors says more about us than it does about them I like that one a lot I also liked there was everybody wants to build but nobody wants to maintain uh, it reminds me a lot of just being a human. Uh, that was a lot of my, seems like a weird tie, but with getting sober, I think I had a lot of resentment about having to maintain and be kind and healthy towards my body. There's this like resentment of existing. And I, mm-hmm. so I think, think that sentence is a very kind of metaphorical quote. We all want to build a house. We don't want to maintain it. We all want to build a career, but we don't want to necessarily do the work to keep ourselves healthy. We all want to, we want the the result, but not mm-hmm. the the tediousness that is necessary to, to maintain the, the actual happiness and balance in our lives. And I also like that they ate the moldy cantaloupe that they spawned all the penicillin from. That was one of those moments where I went, well, but the, it was moldy. Well, so I <laughs> don't actually, if I understood it correctly, at that point, it wasn't actually moldy. They were just like okay. swabbing anything they could find to try to find okay. better penicillin So it's just like latent existing bacteria. So just like, thing. I don't know. Is there some on this cantaloupe? Yeah, <laughs> um, just like we got a moldy, <laughs> smushy cantaloupe. Like, yeah, like, everybody, everybody get us food. It's the 1940s. <laughs> Food's cheap. The food isn't just yeah, grown I mean, on trees. You gotta, you good. gotta do something while your culture's culture, man. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But uh, no, the uh, what was the thing that I was going back to? Shoot, uh, the the him saying that his how we deal with things reflects how we are dealing with that, or how we view things is how we deal with them, not how. They actually are. He repeats mm-hmm. again yeah, when he's talking about scratch and stiff snickers. Ah, scratch That's and good. sniff stickers. That, those are all <laughs> correct words now. <laughs> uh, I do want to know what a scratch and sniff snickers is, though, now. <laughs> Ooh. I think they already exist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I uh, want it. So another one. Don't and get now limited, I'm... Nathan. Just now pick I'm... up those snickers and scratch them and sniff them. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> and this oh that's the other and like several times where he's talking about essentially uh i'm thinking of the one later where he's in uh eating icelandic hot dogs <laughs> and, he, and he it's about how he was dealing with the the circumstances around the hot dog rather than anything about the hot dog itself the whole like the the problem i could feel that hangover versus... yeah <laughs> really i felt that <laughs> and now the sauna yes, <laughs> yeah, just trying to but yeah trying to deal with how the reality separates from your perception of it well and case- we are so good at convincing ourselves that what we think and feel is true and this is a problem with uh across we, we're dealing with a lot of it right now being in our pandemic circumstances and people feeling a certain way about something, but not listening to the actual facts and information or even being able to interpret them because they're difficult to wrap your mind around. And I really liked his chapter uh, where he touches back to the cholera scares and how everything, although that's also anytime I read something like that, it is fatiguing and alarming. It almost makes my heart rate accelerate being like, we're just repeating the same thing. We're never, we're never learning. We're never paying more attention. We're never listening more. We're never trying to comprehend. We just feel and we react and it makes me feel (laughs) afraid of our primal nature um, in a way that is also simultaneously comforting that because I feel like we will get through it, but yeah. um, Yeah. It's people are incredibly bad at change. Like even if they know their own failing decision-making, they're incredibly bad at doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. So much. Like, and and that's inside of a single lifetime of a single person. That's not, structurally or culturally or yeah. historically like i have i have not uh, i have i i am i have a problem where i am a critic and i read a lot of stuff so i have like some answers to some things but like yeah. that is a structural concept that i have no idea how to deal with yeah it's hard because it's like emotional based right depends yes did you guys ever hear that statistic it was talking about american test scores of high school students and we ranked you know 49th 
in actual how we did on the tests, but when asked how we felt we did, Americans ranked far and away number one uh, <laughs> that we felt we did great. So, which I think is a very proud uh, part of our culture in a way, but also I do insane. have a copy of Team America World Police. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you want. I saw it opening night, don't worry. But I think, yeah, that's just such a... Uh, yeah, I really liked this book's analysis of yeah perception of how things make us feel versus how they actually are, and especially with all of his his history with uh, dealing with people who are really terminally ill and have, the way he talks about loss. I think if I'd read this book, if this had come out when I was in my early twenties, it might have messed me up a little bit because he has such a fatalistic. There's this really like things end, uh, we die. That's it. Like there's, I think stuff like that in my twenties, I would not have handled well. It might have made me feel kind of shook up, but in my thirties. And having passed through a lot more just life and loss, I kind of go, I, there's like a comfort to this acknowledgement and this shared collective experience. And I like, I like when things like that are brought up in ways like John Green did. They're, they're gentle and they're real, but they're not, they're not shrouded. They're very truthful. And I think humans should acknowledge those things more. We spend a lot of our time numbing away from realities. And if we were more more realistic about what our situation is and what we are. We might focus more energy on being happy and loving each other. And that's my hippie communist nonsense for the day, maybe, but it's, I think it's true that because I ultimately am not a nihilist, even though I'm an atheist and recognize death as, as an inevitable thing, because I care that I hear and I'm grateful for being here and grateful that you're all here. And I think that being a priority in like my mental striation is a really good thing that more people I would hope would get. And I like, I feel like he has that, that he, he puts the value into things that he thinks are meaningful and gives life meaning in a really beautiful way. Stoicism. So, yeah. 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 Absurdism from my perspective, but. Flamboyant stoicism <laughs> for me, yes. <laughs> I have a question for all of you. Uh, have any of you read a John book before now? Because I had not. I've oh. read, oh, yeah. I've read, I think two, I've read Looking for Alaska and oh, what's the other one that I read? Let me look at this. I heard good things. All stars. Yeah, turtles all the way down. Turtles all the way down. I actually have Turtles all the way down yeah. on my bookshelf over there. Um, oh yeah. I borrowed um, the Looking for Alaska from a friend in high school. Um, they're, they're really good. It's, mm. uh, you can see a little bit of his writing style in this, even though both of those books are fiction and this is nonfiction, like his actual essays, you, you, he, you can really see him in his writing, which I think is really oh. cool. And so having read those two books of him and reading this one, it's just like, and also having seen like some of his vlog brothers videos where like, you like actually hear him, like he's, he seems very genuine in who he is and the stuff that he creates. Yeah. I highly recommend the vlog brothers because that's how I, I only just started re watching them. What Eric, two years ago. And I, so 2020, you know, when we were all, yeah. <laughs> when the thing, the thing happens i yeah. don't know how long it's been since and we all made that show and whatever so, other things yes yeah uh, but it, cool cool it, it, so nathan it's good to it's interesting that he you can kind of see him in his writing because i really like how he talks um on there it, his brother hank is kind of like the <sighs> one and he's kind of like the whoo one <laughs> The emo brother and the check. I had to repeatedly open to the last page with his picture to re to make sure I was reading it in the right one of their voices. <laughs> yes. I didn't know there was a picture. Ah, oh, I know that. Yeah, I have them in my head because the blogs. But Nathan, what about you? What's your uh, what? If you could pick out like one moment in the book that resonated the most, the. The quote that I wrote down that stood out the most was I was trying to find the actual uh, I think I wrote the page number uh, down wrong, but it was in the chapter on plague and just like the it really stood out to me. Uh, so the quote is, uh, even when circumstances separate us, in fact, especially when they do, the way through is together. I was like, that is like if we had had that mindset from the beginning, I mean, if we as like a world had that mindset and actually like like believed that we'd be in such a different place and like it i was talking to some people the other day about like if like an interstellar species came down to our planet and saw the divide the lines that we've drawn like between nations and between things that just don't exist except on our maps that we create they'd be like what are you doing 
why are you doing this to yourselves? Like it would, well, who knows, who knows what they would say. They might also blow us up or it might be like, <laughs> they'd also say that the dominant species is cars because we build all of our infrastructure around them. <laughs> That's a good point too. <laughs> I, well, it's good because I stole it from somebody else. Not Although, I didn't make it up. <laughs> in all truth, we are all just microorganism hosts and uh, those statistics on the amount of biomass in microorganisms was insane. But I do, yeah. Nathan, I really love that part as well. The Robert Frost quote, the only mm. way out is through, is uh, a really, really profound statement for a lot anyone who deals with uh, anxiety and... I mean, for, I think for all people could relate a little bit, like, but mm-hmm. especially like grief and anxiety and pain and times of trauma to, uh, there's a lot of encouragement in how we live to, to try to turn away, but you have to turn forward. And I loved his using that quote to say that we should, we should hold hands while we do that too, that we should go through together. Yeah. It was really it, beautiful. It goes to the is, book. Go ahead. Well, that's why I think the book is structured the way it is too, because it's such a big thing that you can't deal with it all at once. Mm. So he's like, okay, I'm going to focus on a thing and mm. I'm going to move towards the, the bigger pro the bigger context. And I'm going to move away from it onto a more, a smaller thing and break things down because I can't get on the whole thing. And this is not, and I, obviously it's not new. You break down reality and people break down reality into stories so that they can comprehend them. Um, what was the thing thinking think I was thinking of shoot. Uh, like you saw, he's, the last chapter where he's talking about the three farmers picture where it's he's imagining all uh how life is in this slice right before the world blows up around them because yeah. how can you deal with world war 1 yeah. how can you deal with an enti- a pandemic that sweeps the globe and changes at how everybody has to live well you can you can look at your lawn and you can look at how absurd it is that you have to, you take care of a lawn. I also like when he said that we need to stop saying this is a once in a lifetime thing yeah. because it, they keep it keeps well what if we don't know what's going to happen this could happen in 3 more years what, whose lifetime is that that's like yes a lot Hopefully of acknowledgement a long of that time so yeah yeah and i liked in that also as well when he talks about i don't remember which chapter is it the cnn chapter i think talking about how news is yeah, the focus being on new and that's such an important thing yeah. in general. And then especially now that providing context and I loved the little bit at the end where the person was walking through and like, look at the destruction in, in Baghdad and the roommate laughs and it's like, oh, that says, uh, you know, hey, a happy birthday despite the circumstances yeah. or something, <laughs> something like that. And it looks like it's terrible graffiti, but it's just in Arabic. And yeah, it's, I think that that again, that the overarching, kind of the, if there was a point that he was trying to convey is the, what we see isn't always the reality and that we need to look at the big picture and also look at the details and look at why things are, not just that they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's critical thinking stuff. It's so important. How news deals with that called amusing ourselves to death by Neil Postman, which I have recommended in the past to every single person I've thought to recommend it to. Okay. Put that in the chat too. Yes, please. Hooray. Fabulous. A note. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Uh, well, shoot. Well, and I think a lot of the, there's so much emphasis on perseverance as well and survival. He, he covers an enormous amount of information and just human experience. Uh, I thought it was really great, but I love that the idea that the reason we've been able to survive not only because of our brains, but was just that we looked at an animal that was stronger and faster than us, and we said we're going to run after you until one of us dies. <laughs> and then I will eat you. And I think like that made me feel pumped up early on. I was like, yeah, yeah. chase it down, guys. Like, get heat it. Stroke a gazelle and or run at a he- gazelle until it heat strokes and just bash <laughs> it with a rock. <laughs> you didn't evolve to sweat. We'll, we'll figure oh. out tools and spears and stuff later. <laughs> we can just chase you. Sweat glands <laughs> first, spears later. We did it. And that's why we're all here today, which is quite miraculous that we think about all of our predating ancestors back to the dawn of time, they survived. Mm. They chased down something potentially faster and stronger. Oh. Ah, that's so amazing. This book <laughs> made me think about things like that a lot. It's fun. That was a fun thing. Uh, Nathan, I just wanted to make sure you, after that quote, was there anything else you wanted to add to that? No, that, that was no, just okay. the biggest thing. That was the, oh, yeah. the, the, I mean, I'll, that was, I think, the thing that stood out the most to me from it. It's the only quote that I like 
pulled out at the time. It was just like, I need to Perfect. add this to my quote list. I put an initial if I see anyone look like they wanted to add something just in case. Ah, <laughs> I mean, the only note that you know, specific quote that came out to me was trying out strawberry hill wine for the first time in 20 years. <laughs> Uh, I, I agree with the the review of this wine. It's, it's a, a strong hint of strawberry with an undertone of hill. Yes. <laughs> I I laughed audibly for that. It was very funny. I also liked. I think I don't know if you all have like a, a favorite funny moment as well, but I really liked this idea that we're all just Canada geese farmers because of our lawn habits. That made me laugh. The Canada geese actually. Uh, thrive better if there are humans around and mm-hmm. there's a flock that lives near us who likes to walk down the street and not care about the cars Jeez. so because they're pedestrians they're not <laughs> they're our neighbors uh the right. the campus in town has a artificial lake uh for two swans which they have to like they have to keep there because they're actually the one that's an invasive species in this area they, they have to like maintain them and then the oh. geese also just live there because they made us yeah. Made an artificial lake for some swans, and the geese like it just fine. Oh my gosh! Um, yeah, I grew up in Minnesota. Like, did I act? I think I only actually went goose hunting once. Uh, they're I'll really, they're kind of annoying to hunt and <laughs> and actually kill. They do not die easily, oddly enough. What? I don't think I actually <laughs> hit any of them. Yeah, fowl are usually pretty hard just because they're so hollow. It's you're not generally hitting something that would kill them quickly <laughs> also if you're ever being advanced on by a goose my best technique has been to take my hands and put it them over because they don't like things being over them and they'll back up so that's how i have uh combated the geese looks kind of weird you're like mm. Going after the geese, looking like a zombie. I mean, but still, gotta, it gotta fight though. The geese aren't gonna stop. Who cares? No. Nope. <laughs> Emily, that I always is... learn another amazing survival tip every time. A lot of it is is bird related. It's, uh, which yeah, it's funny how that great. works. <laughs> Peacocks, geese, chickens. We'll be able to wrangle all of them by the time this is over. Quarter staffs, tall rubber boots, and uh, an imposing figure. <laughs> that, those are my to war with foul <laughs> tips. <laughs> Pal more tips. Pal more. Oh my. I I I was rereading some notes, and the other part that actually stood out to me is a individual quote. He's talking about new partner by I can't remember the name of the the singer of it. That he it was the song that for him uh, returned or made him back into the people that he was Mm -hmm. in the times he was listening to it before. So we are a collection of the people that we were. Well, it's it, yeah. It's a very it's a reminiscence heavy book. So it's the mm-hmm. second to last essay is that song yeah. where he's uh, pointing out that all of it. Like I read it as pointing out that huge part uh, sections of the book is about what he was before and how it ended up where he is now. Yeah, he's had a he's, very interesting life mm-hmm. too. I mean, we he. I feel like there were different chapters of his life that it didn't seem like the same person a lot of the time. Like it was just a really amazing sequence of, you know, for someone who has, you know, CD and anxiety and things to then have kind of packed up and traveled so much, which is a really bold thing to do to kind of relocate around the country. And uh, I just, I thought that was really, it was a really interesting glimpse into who he is. And again, I really like hearing that his voice comes across and his personality so much in his fiction books, because I really liked getting to know him and, uh, yeah. it, just, it struck me that he's lived a lot of lives in his one life, that he's done a lot of different things and experienced a lot. And, and I think that that's why his voice comes through in a lot of his not his fiction stuff, because like Turtles All the Way Down is about someone who has OCD. And so he channeled a lot of his own experience with OCD in that book. And so like knowing that – don't remember if I knew that he uh, had OCD before I read the book. I think so. Um, but like knowing that it makes – it like make sense why he chose the topics that he did yeah that makes sense i I know that the editor had a lot to do with the order that they were in Mm. so he was able to write freely um and i know that there were a lot of them that actually didn't wind up in the book i thought that was interesting too um i'll I'll actually listen to the podcast shoot 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I would like to. Yeah, there. The, I, I scrolled through, and there were a number of them were, that were clearly not sections in the book, but I yes. didn't actually listen to them. Uh, I'll I'll post it when I can alt tab. But there there was a recent vlog that he did um, about a travel a, a travel that he did where there was a dentist, and it was really interesting and kind of summed up traveling and dealing with it mentally and the kind of loop that you wind up in and it was also just a very funny story so i'll i'll post that one because i i felt like one of these stories when he i think he what really got me was it was such a unique way of looking at the world in a way that we do all the time right like it's nothing novel but it was i mean it was a novel uh (laughs) But it it is, it makes you start looking at like, oh, I'd give that tree, you know, what do I like about that tree? It's not even about the end result of a review. It's like really looking at it and being like, you know, I, I've always liked that tree. Let me give it a second to really appreciate it. So I think that was a, a nice message overall. Those books that I think, sorry, it really does. A, it, I thought it, it did bring up a lot of awareness. Like I really liked the... Uh, the third focus as a part of intimacy with a, a friend or partner that it's not necessarily staring deeply at each other. I've been thinking about that a lot and how many things Marlon and I share and have in common and how that that's such a strong form of our bonding and how it is with a lot of other, I thought that was really sweet. And yeah. so I know for me, that's one thing I've been like, Oh, I've been thinking about all the things we look at that we love together or that have been, you know, magnificent or profound or, or funny. And uh, yeah. I liked that a lot. Yeah. There's a phrasing I came across years ago. It was one of the few like t-shirt, uh, literal t-shirt designs that was actually like valuable was something like love does not require you to look at each other, but look at uh, look in the same direction. Mm, I like that. Yeah. And I, I mean, I am, I deny this to myself constantly that I am one of the most sentimental emotional people I've ever met. So something like this at this stage in my life where I'm a little more accepting of like of how soft and squishy I am. And his, he talked about like how weakness isn't valued and all that thing. And the recognition that humans that we are weak and that we're squishy and that we can yeah. uh, feel softly towards things and feel love towards things. And also think about things that might seem insignificant in a significant way and allow ourselves the space for that. I like that he it just had this very like egalitarian feel. There was just this really Mm. like all things can be valuable and important and all things are deserving of consideration if you want to consider them and that it's worth looking more deeply. And I really just, it made me feel very just comforted and, and all, but also very like awakened and aware. Like I started the same thing, like, Oh, what would I rate that thing that's been in my life a long time or that I did that one time in my life that I remember forever. And what does that mean to me? And what does that mean to be human to have those yeah. those kinds of experiences? Very profound. That's nice. That's nice. I give concussions one star. <laughs> <laughs> but I might have had one. It wasn't. I didn't actually go to a doctor for it, but Ooh, reasonable yeah. possible. If, if you, it if, felt like if, it, probably was <laughs> a, a head impact that knocks you unconscious. Usually a con- concussion. Yeah, that would do it. Hey, as long as you smashes sleep against right your I'm also, sure maybe do don't, you know, follow behind pickup trucks if you're going faster than they are on a bicycle. Ooh. Oh, done so many stupid things on a bike. <laughs> it's so haven't we? Uh, haven't we all? Yeah. Oh. I think John Green had as well since he had. Well, I don't know. He might have. I don't know what the, ah, the nature of his biking accident was that he uh, had his all of his teeth. He mm-hmm. talks about it a little bit in the book that he was going through like multiple tooth <sighs> extractions and surgeries from a bike incident. Yeah, so, I did not look it up. Yeah. I don't want to know. No, yeah. no, we don't have to think about that. Uh, I have a question mm-hmm. for you guys. What did you think about his quote about, I've always felt like I need a vice. I have some way down vibrating part of my uh, subconscious. No, wait. I don't know what I wrote there. That needs to self-destruct at least a little bit. I mean specifically for me having gone through inpatient rehab for a substance and then going through that you know whatever my limited my limited journey with it uh with how 
substances play a role in our lives, how vices play a role in our lives, how there's a lot of emphasis on both abstinence and on harm reduction in that community. Uh, so I, I see, I think it really, really depends. I think just laying that out as a blanket statement is a little bit from, and I know I, I look at things through like a sobriety wellness lens a lot because it's a significant part of my life and I kind of can't avoid it now that I'm in this, in this path. That's what I, that's what I see a lot. But I think about that for myself too, because I now, uh, I've got a sweet tooth and use, use sweets and desserts in a way that I never did before. I think part of it is pandemic induced, but also sobriety induced where I don't have something that I use to numb because I, don't want to. I could if I wanted to, but I've chosen not to. Um, and so I, I do, I recognize part of me wonders that too. Like, do I just have to have something? But we don't have to. We make the choice to turn to something to My microphone to okay. numb a little bit. But I thought that was really interesting. And from where I remember reading that and being like, that's, you're talking about Diet Dr. Pepper. So it's, it's all right. But you talk about yeah. anything else with that lens and it can be dangerous. It's like, mm -hmm. well, yes, I don't do X anymore. I just do Y. But if Y is still really toxic for you or dangerous or has negative social ramifications that are harmful or whatever, is it's still a vice. Like still keep an eye on it. Yeah. If, if you want an argument in favor of everybody being self-destructive, stand step outside of uh, an AA meeting for a while and watch the Everybody entire meeting file out to smoke. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the entire, also they will like go through about a pot of coffee per person over yes. the course of an AA meeting. Yeah. I, as the only, I was a really interesting cat uh, going through AA and going through, well, first of so going through rehab when I, after detoxing, they, you know, you get your medications at a little counter a couple times a day. There's different times. So once I was off of their anxiety medications they give you to help you get through detox safely, uh, I'd be popping up there like, ha ha, one allergy med, please. And everyone else is lining up for their, you know, antidepressants and other anxieties. But basically as a sober person, I, I don't, I don't take or use anything, which is really interesting. And at the time I also didn't drink any caffeine and I never liked smoking cigarettes because I have asthma. So I was always there just like, ah! and I was like, you're not an addict. What do you mean? doing here i'm like i promise it was i just don't like cigarettes and i uh, can't drink black coffee because it makes me crazy well, so that was, like, was seven years from not having a liver anymore come on <laughs> uh -huh. but yes no that is uh but again harm reduction right cigarettes are not good for you caffeine in you know excess isn't amazing but if you've toned it down from something that could potentially end your life really quickly we mm. take we take the process not the perfection or we're going mm. we're going pro progressive so Yes. And what did you guys think about that, though? Sorry, I always have yeah, a lot to really say about everything. In that lens. Yeah. I mean, I, I I have a number of bad habits that I've never uh, really been able to get under control. So, uh, some for clear short term pleasure reasons, others for just like, I mean, the stuff I think about is just the stuff I've never been able to fix because like I, I only encounter run into it myself every like five years. So then by the time you deal with it again, it's like, oh, that thing that I definitely did learn and I understand is so far recessed that it didn't pop up in time to prevent me making that mistake again. <laughs> so that's uh, probably wildly off topic, though. No, 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 that, no, that's perfectly on topic. It's the vibrating part of our whatever I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> well, and how common it is for people to want to be self-destructive. And I... the. For me personally, the self-destructive tendencies were so clearly, as I did more therapy and took more time to be really reflective, it was such, a, it was the, the inverse of the negative self-esteem. It was an inverse of pain. And as that has been corrected mm. for, as I've focused on improving something instead of like trying to, it's like, I, I, I deal with the sugar and the, like whatever vices I have that are, you know, not life altering. Yeah. And I'm like, let them just be what they are. Don't stress yourself out with them. Focus on making sure that your core and your soul is is nurtured and cared for. And then things tend to settle out. And then you're also, I don't know, it's a process of not being so hard on yourself when when you do have an every five years where something might go a little awry or not quite how you would have done it because you understand that you're, you're human and you're just trying and things get you. There's a lot of tempting, delicious, wonderful, sexy, fun things. So we just have to just try. But mostly try to love ourselves. That's the thing that will help ease all the other pains is the being kind and recognizing our weakness and frailty and that how much strength and resilience that can be. Because we're powerful beings. 
I like you said that we're very charismatic. I agree. (laughs) It's funny because I I do feel like for me, even though maybe I don't have um, to, I I try to just avoid having anything that I know is going to hurt me anywhere near me, because if it's not near me, that helps a lot. She says in front of a cabinet full of weapons. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hey, no, those, those are, those are relatively the, safe yeah, those I are know. to hurt other people <laughs> i'm gonna sort of smaller so that helps <laughs> but right. when i'm making my tea every so often i'll be like you know what and i just i put some sugar in it i don't know why because i don't need it i drink my tea without it all the time but then all of a sudden it's like that vibration i guess i'm like <laughs> I, I think it's like the little bit of the brain that wants without either wants like that reward or like something that we know is bad for us like we get kind of like a kick out of being like oh i'm doing this bad thing and sometimes it's just ours, you know? mm-hmm. and it, yeah. it's sometimes it's something like like sugar that's like in like moderation it's not a lot mm-hmm. of the stuff is like in moderation it's total it's usually fine but sometimes it can spiral into now it becomes something that it's more you're more reliant on this to get through things and then it's like that like there's probably more there that is being channeled mm-hmm. into this because it's a there's a comfort in it i think that or the, like it gets to be comforting so you just like fixate on that for a while yes yes totally agree <laughs> Well, and it's like a lot of it is intent, right? If you just, if you, and it's one thing to rely on your diet, Dr. Pepper for the caffeine and cause you like it. But if you literally use it, I've noticed I do this. I've sat down with a piece of chocolate cake that I intentionally bought because I was having a horrible day and been like, yes, please take away the things I'm feeling. And that's not good. (laughs) That's still, (laughs) so if I'm just like, I want this, it's going to be fun. I, I deserve it. Whatever. I'm not worried about it. That's, then I think it's things aren't really a vice in the same way, are they? Mm-hmm. But if you're using them to to deny a reality or to escape, but we all also it's extremely exhausting being present all the time. So I do think that they have a place. I just I, just for my I'm obviously being really cautious even about this one sentence because no, of, for sure for myself it's like oh just remember be mindful about where you're coming from so that you're supporting yourself. That was one reason why I was curious because of that kind of, um, we all have different like histories with that too. I, I did definitely hold on to things that physically hurt me for way too long. Like it's so simple, like milk, like I knew I shouldn't drink milk, but I didn't want to stop to bask. Anyway, (laughs) uh, I, if you don't mind, uh, I have a couple more questions that, uh, also it was interesting because, uh, they brought, were brought up in the thread too, so um, maybe before if each that, of us... um, mm-hmm. just there was another section that I uh, oh, yeah, tracked down that just that really stuck out to me. It was in his the the essay on sunsets. His oh, the way that he yes. rates the sunset in the end, like I just it really uh, really stuck with me. I'll, I'll read it just because I I really Please. like it. Um, I said, it's... um. So it, it is a sunset and it's beautiful. And this whole thing you've been doing where nothing gets five stars because nothing is perfect, that's bullshit. So much is perfect. Starting with this, I give sunsets five stars. That really stuck out with me. Like, I'm a very self-critical person, like, of anything that I do and, like, am around. And so I, like, growing up, it was always the, okay, cool, this is done, but how could I done it better so that the next time I have to do it, it's better? It's like, instead of just sitting with something, being like, this is fine, it, like accept it for what it is and like not everything is to be judged and not everything is to be like really torn apart like that and that comes like from ye- like my entire family like the one that sticks out to me is my grandma came over to visit us once and like my mom opened the door and my grandma in spanish was just like your garage door is dirty you should really fix you should really go and clean that <laughs> it's just like hi mom <laughs> like it's been like a month since they saw each other and the first thing she said is you have a dirty garage door <laughs> Just a reminder, you're failing at something today. Mm-hmm. In case you, yeah. in case you thought everything was fine. Well, the pro- I know I've seen it in myself. I know I've seen it criticized in other people. That criticism itself is a way of distancing yourself from usually a partic- either the particular thing or sort of the emotional structure surrounding it. And, and that particular section, like using it to be like, rather than separate myself from it, I'm going to go toward it was actually fantastic mm-hmm. because it's like 
using criticism rather than to disengage, to engage. Yeah. But I like that too, Nathan, this idea that some things can just be beautiful and be okay. And mm-hmm. that I think that really plays into this, a lot of just our culture about mm-hmm. trying to achieve more and always trying to do more and be more and gain more. And uh, that yeah. and he talks about in the monopoly chapter, which was really interesting about how we simultaneously, you know, despise and completely envy uh, all millionaires and billionaires because there's so much emphasis on money and the process to gaining money and, you know, stepping on those stones to get there, that that's such an achievement and something that should be so admired and that we could just be, we could just enjoy our sunsets and our lives a little bit more. And uh, yeah, the the history of the monopoly stuff is fascinating too, that there's always a woman somewhere who invented it first and then collaborated (laughs) and doesn't get any credit. Um, But yeah, very interesting that you had that reaction. uh, Rosalind Franklin. Yes. Mm-hmm. True. Uh, sunsets. That was definitely one that stood out for me. I didn't actually write it down at all, but I think I just wound up really enjoying reading it and just imagining what the mirrors would look like. Oh, yes. the gl- oh, That's oh, right. I- you had to wear these glasses with the mirrors and that's how you got the most picturesque. Isn't what an amazing? insane thing. And I like he talks about how we can't like I even like the we can't stare at the sun directly but it is the reason for our existence and then there was interesting kind of parallels with the bible and jesus being the sun and sun and how that also plays into like uh you know all sorts of astrological things and Mm -hmm. uh that it is our divine god the sun that we cannot stare at um we can look at in crazy weird victorian glasses Oh, doesn't the sunset look beautiful? Staring away from it. It's a perfect frame around it. So you have have to to change it just a little bit to get close enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little alteration in the nature. (laughs) So crazy. Uh, Are there more questions, too? I Actually, if if, uh, I was wondering what you guys thought of these two quotes. Uh, when humanity protects the frail among us and works to ensure their survival, the human project as a whole gets stronger. It is the long, it is the long arc, arc of history that we figured out. Oh yeah, just like that, de- deciding what is good and bad, and then destroying anything that is bad is not not quite how that works out, guys. Hmm. We, yeah, I actually on the way home was listening to uh, NPR talking about critical race theory and how there's, which has been just a term that's been co-opted and just run away with, which some people are very good at doing. It's It's amazing. Um, But this idea that we need to not, that we need to not focus on groups or identities that need to be supported, that the people in power, the people who are privileged want to cling to that privilege so much Mm -hmm. instead of going, no, let's accommodate people. Let's give them their space. Let's talk about what happened. Uh, let's, you know, help people who are, have, you know, are injured or deal with all sorts of different weird stages of our lives and different struggles that we that we go, no, that didn't happen. Get out of here. Like, I mean, it just is so deleterious. It just, and it's just, uh, it, just it makes me sad. Oh, it's really just an insult song, to humanity. That's how the world works by Bo Burnham. <laughs> <laughs> But I do think it's true that we like, you have to, you have to correct for wrongs done in life and also by supporting people who need it and who are, you know, weaker in whatever sense, whether that be, you know, economically or physically or whatever the limitation is that the focus should be on, on boosting each other because this fear of some equal playing field is such insane narcissism and doesn't exist. You know, I, I do think. I'm I'm a hippie communist. I want to just have a big commune cuddle puddle. It's so obvious, but it's true because life is hard enough. Life is just existing. I'm extremely privileged and this shit's rough. So of course, of course it would be worthwhile for more more of us to take our energy and put it into helping people who need it. And that's another thing he says that it's like the worst thing that happened to tuberculosis or to, I can't remember which disease was his example, but the worst thing that ever happened to poor countries that struggle with it is rich countries figuring out how to, solve it for themselves malaria. and then, then that's malaria mm. yeah. yes thank you so but that, it, 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 yeah. it was generalized to several others he was just specifically mentioning malaria. yes but malaria. That that's an example where once a group in power and privilege the the strong group 
has it solved, they they forget conveniently about the the week and how much damage that does and how much inequity that creates and that it does make us weaker as a populace that we're unable to help each other solve these problems when we can. There is, I mean, that, that one's actually kind of interesting. My understanding, particularly of a number of those number of diseases that the U S does not currently deal with that we are, we are still involved. We, one of, uh, one of the problems of, or, the thing we were mentioning earlier, how that's that's how I need to phrase this. The, what we were mentioning earlier, people not learning as an overall culture of, from the past. Sometimes we do. There are aid programs. Malaria, I don't, I think, is too endemic in a lot of places to really wipe out. But I know, mm-hmm. like for example, Jimmy Carter had gotten what was it, guinea worm? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. this horrible mm-hmm. parasite that like burrows out through your skin over the course of weeks. They had white nearly white they i don't think they'd wiped it out but they had nearly wiped it off the face of the earth by just decades and decades of late of working on it but yeah i know there are a lot of things you're right it's it is imperfect and we screw it up all the time Mm -hmm. well there are a lot of things that aren't sometimes but if people like from for malaria and for a lot of things just having the proper treatment and care is what's missing, right? We don't distribute the resources to make sure somebody stays properly hydrated or has a medication that helps because we can't necessarily get rid of it. But I completely, I know what you're, I see what you're saying with the like, we try a little bit still, some things are too big of a hill to climb, but it's just the the priorities of being alive and being a human are very strange. There's parallels. Oh, sorry. No, you're good. Um, There's parallels with the malaria thing to covid vaccines now as well like the, mm. the countries that have developed them are not necessarily like i don't know you hoarding feels like too much of an inflammatory word but in a way like it's not being distributed to other countries that are also seeing high cases and are like are in need of this stuff and we have the resources as the as richer countries to provide that but we're just not providing that and then internally there's this like the movements against the vaccinations because of misinformation about vaccinations. And it's just, it's. How is living in California, Emily? Oh, I don't know. I live in a house with trees outside. Are there people still here? <laughs> do they go out there things? somewhere? <laughs> there are and nice people. Off, the measles haven't caught up food. with you yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, luckily for me, I always wore a mask at work anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> apparently, we almost eradicated bed bugs entirely. I was on Reddit last night. Uh, wow! So this Ew. is a Reddit fact, so beware. Okay. Um, but uh, asterisk. Do you know about that, Nathan? I, I've heard of it. It's been a while, but I think it was like it, New York was a big like there was a chemical that they were using to clean like like wiped out almost the entire population but then like they i think if they had just done it a little bit longer it would have but then they stopped and then bed bugs spread this is like a way more human-sized view of ddt and ddt had a lot of negative consequences yeah ddt was it yeah humans well at least we got to see isabella rossellini's delightful reenactment of uh bed bug mating if you haven't seen it uh <laughs> she's in a full-size bed bug costume it is an it. insane piece of Can comedic in the, in the yes i will try to find okay. it <laughs> oh bed <my> gosh. <laughs> uh it saved my life but it also did a lot of other things last i have no note on what that means. I'm trying to remember what that's from. Out of context, it's a very interesting quote. <laughs> what what has saved your life, Nathan? But also did a lot of other things. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I have a note on the academic uh, de- uh, decathlon. Is that how you say it? Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Decathlon. Um, I I thought it was interesting. Oh my gosh. As a side note, I'd like to say how excited I am for anyone in the media club chat to wonder why there's a two minute video of Isabella Rossellini in a bed bug costume titled seduce me. So (laughs) go and 
<laughs> that's what they get for not being here. No, it, they, it, it, never especially know. after the the links that Erica posted, which was like, that's connected. I can see how that's connected to the <laughs> book that they're reading, and then just yes. bed bug sex. <laughs> what is this book? <laughs> oh boy, uh, showing the fear of now. Oh oh. Okay, yes, the the na- the the now echoed in the memories of yesterday. This is not a quote. This is just a thought of mine. It's a little meh. But okay, so showing the fear of now echoed in the memories of yesterday. How the present defines the importance of the past. Um, the for the academic decathlon, I thought it was really interesting how he approached that whole topic. How he was showing the process and and like that roof moment where that just is like a, a beacon in his memory, in his past, in his life. And he kind of set a beacon because of that moment of thought and presence that then he keeps as a way of checking in with, like you guys said, uh, I think Eric said um, one of, one of his selves that he once was I thought that was really interesting. Uh, like having a conversation somehow through time and space. It's almost like lucid dreaming while awake. It's, I feel like in a lot of those moments, for me, you recognize, you don't feel separated from it. You don't feel like the spell is broken and you're going to wake up necessarily, but yeah. you sort of look around and everything slows down and you realize that this is a, a magical coalescence, that you're in a time that will never happen again, but it isn't sad. It's just a nice nice thing to sort of realize and look at and and that's happened that's happened to me a lot too where you go i think this is going to change how i feel about myself um and how i feel about my life and i like i like this idea of acknowledging that acknowledging mm-hmm. those times because they're pretty rare mm-hmm. yeah any shows do that for you, Nathan? I was actually th- just thinking that there was a. Uh, really? I don't think they they publish comics anymore, but it's called. It was called Q to Q Comics. It was like fun backstage yeah. stuff. But every now and then yeah. they had like really like kind of deep and insightful ones. And there was one where the stage manager character was like, they were someone was asking the stage manager character like, oh, how are you feeling about closing? They're just like happy to have been a part of this, but also kind of sad. They're like sad why? They're just like in one sense like. Uh, it's it's been I forgot what like the positive part of it, but the part that really stuck with me was uh, them saying like, but on the other hand, this exact production with this exact group of people will never happen again. And I think that's something powerful about the- theater and working in theater. Like mm-hmm. unlike other mediums like that that are recorded, you can go back and experiencing them experience them again exactly how they were intended to be. But like theater because it's live and off the cuff is uh not off the cuff it's it's, i mean there are there is that is off the cuff but it's not supposed to be off the cuff it's supposed to be (laughs) on the script uh but like all the work that gets poured into it from everybody behind the scenes to everybody on stage is just there for that moment and then it's just a memory past that and maybe some photos but there's not like a real record of it and even like if you watch a recording of a theatrical performance the thing that i don't like about that even if it has an audience in there is like there's a feeling you get being Lot, like present in the theater watching the production that's not the same as just watching it uh online and the the i the mug that i have is actually conveniently from the production that i uh that i thought of is the last show i did in, in college like this was the fourth show i did with this organization it was just really it it hit me at the end of that one like just it, like the like the, it was kind of like a capstone on my time in college but also like time yeah. working with that organization it's so like... nice. What a blessing to have fond memories, though. I feel like I have so many bad oh. memories. And so it's such a, it is like, there is this beautiful sadness of like, oh, this is never going to be like this ever again. But to to have the fortuitous, to have that moment of, oh, but this was so great. And I wish it would happen again. But I also know that it won't. And it's good that it won't because trying to replicate it is pointless. And that's really, that's just really a lovely thing because a lot of shitty memories. <laughs> well, I, I, so it's so nice to have the ones that you're like, I'm uh, so with, grateful to want to remember this and to have loved this experience. Yeah. So nice. do, to be able to say as the is in the introduction at the end of his at the end of his life, the great picture book author and illustrator Maurice Sendak said on the NPR show Fresh Air, 
I cry a lot because I miss people. I cry a lot because they die and I can't stop them. They leave me and I love them more. I find, I'm finding out as I'm aging that I'm in love with the world. Mm. That's beautiful. That's nice. Yeah. I, I will say I'm glad I ended it on In the Heights and not the one that was the year before that, which was Legally Blonde, which uh, <laughs> took years off of my life. That was one of the worst productions <laughs> I've ever worked on. So I feel like material production, yes to everything. Wow. Yes to everything. <laughs> it was oh. just a, it was a cluster of a production. Oh boy. Oh, like, oh. like that one is. Yeah. Yeah. I can't was... wait to hear some we need to just have a hangout where I listen to theater stories. Oh. I would love to many. Yeah. Love to hear more. There's so sad. <laughs> too many <laughs> too many like that that the legally blonde stuff just recounting that would be like an hour just going down the ra- i remember I, for it. I was i was i was talking to some friends about it and like i was this was like months afterwards but i was getting worked up about it because it was just like still not not fresh but like so like uh impactful that like their cat came over because the cat could tell and it was just like sad on oh. me and it's like the cat sensed that you need some comfort right now or he was just uh uh like sucking in all the that sorrow the hate like, yes. like yes, yes. Oh. one of my friends Correct. recently you gotta know the cat better to yeah. judge True. one of my friends who's a vegetarian said recently that he thinks animals really like him and come up to him a lot because he's a vegetarian and he doesn't eat meat. And I was like, I think they come up to you because they don't, they think you don't know how to feed yourself. <laughs> <So they're... laughs> Which I said in front of a group of people and like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to accidentally say that you are a, a, a baby animal that the animals are trying to care for. <laughs> well, wouldn't he smell like prey? Yes, he probably would. I know he was being way too generous with himself. I think they like it because they can tell I don't eat meat. It's like, no, no, no. They think you are incompetent. That's funny. <laughs> but who knows? Uh, favorite essay chapter, guys. I mean, the Kentucky bluegrass one got me fired up. I was mm-hmm. ready and I was angry, <laughs> and I was like, "I'm gonna go start the garden now." And well, there'll be blueberry plants like along the it, along the sidewalk, and the neighborhood kids can have as many as they want. It, every, every week that I hear the people doing lawn maintenance in my apartment complex, I'm like, "Curse you, society! Why do we have these?" It's also because like I'm trying to focus and just loud lawn equipment that going. Too. I'm just like, that counts. Um, the uh, you'll ne- the actually first essay you'll never walk alone. That mm. uh, they took. Like, just this weird show tune. Like, oh yeah, we're just gonna sing this song that you can tilt, you can sing a little, you can tilt it a little bit and sing it mournfully after a loss. You can tilt it a little bit and sing it happily after a win. And that's gonna be the sh- the the song of a soccer team. Not, uh, not you know, We Will Rock You by Queen <laughs> or a, a traditional fight song. It's you'll never walk alone. <laughs> I really enjoyed that first chapter too. Yeah, it's a really good way to lead off. Actually. Yeah, it, it was like a perfect, like the the beginning and ending chapters. I think were really well placed and well chosen. Um, I give the editor four and a half stars. <laughs> <Yes>. Same. <laughs> I think mine also was. I think the one that at least. I had a really emotional response to it was the for old Lang sign. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, I just cried. I just cried and cried, but I, I secretly craved that in my life. I think I'm just like, yes, pour out all the feelings go. Um, mm-hmm. But I thought, cause I actually, I have a lot of weird gaps in my world history and American history. And I hadn't heard the story about the peace, that Christmas Eve peace between the Germans and the British Oh. Uh, yes. usually called the Christmas Armistice. But... The Christmas Armistice. Yeah, or, you're, you're I don't know. I, it up later. I will. I maybe. I also, uh, from my years of taking very intense anxiety meds to deal with really chronic panic attacks, a lot of stuff has just been kind of deleted. So I may have heard it at some time with a very caring, uh, you know, professor or teacher, but it just went away. But I thought that was really beautiful. And then he's talking about his friend uh, Amy Amy Rosenthal mm-hmm. and her yeah. version of the, you know we're here because we're here uh, version. And I really liked, I thought that was, that like summed up a lot of what the book had to offer. And 
And yeah, I just cried. <laughs> Because I'll cry if something sad happens and I'll cry if something sentimental happens and I'll cry at the existence and the strife of humans and how we, you know, still try our best and try to love each other. And yeah, it was great. I'm going to post you a commercial that you're going to cry about. Ah! <laughs> I've cried in Budweiser commercials, so don't get me started. Like the horses are so majestic. <laughs> and those frogs are such good friends. <laughs> <laughs> you catch me on a bad day and that'll do it. Oh, man. What about you, Nathan, Emily? I don't Favorite know. One? Because I I think originally I would, I would have said the plague one, which is the one that I pulled that quote from earlier, just because like he somehow made something that is like an internet like an international pandemic to be like also still inspiring. But at the same mm-hmm. time, even just remembering the sunsets one, I think the sunsets one is the one that stood like stuck with me the most to just like live in the moment more and just try to be happy and just accept things yeah yeah join me in absurdism everything (laughs) is everything you just kind of live with (laughs) (laughs) we're here because we're here because we're here you know the okay so not you know. Why do I? Oh my! That's oh, we know. Weird. Yeah, you know. So <laughs> we'll move on. So, uh, I am actually tracking you. <laughs> yes, yeah. So you can see, you can see exactly what I mean. Um, uh, I had the most emotional response to two. Okay, so my the Nathan's famous hot dog eating contest. Yeah, really upset me. Him. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, I yeah. was really invested in it. I, I was kind of smiling along. I thought it was so interesting. I was like, yeah, because the theater, right? So it, it resonated on that level of what we can do, how like we can make people smile. We can really bring out something that's absurd, something that's silly and simple and really put importance on it in a way that makes that moment so unique. And the way that chapter ended with really twisting that power into something cruel and so volatile, it really affected me. It was like, oh, that was, how quickly. It was hard to read. That, it really and it was. caught me off guard as well that it went yeah. that direction. Yeah. It, it, it made me angry. It made me mm-hmm. remember how many uh, celebrities or uh, entertainers who have really crushed people because of seeming like they were supportive and then just taking down an entire uh, either minority group or uh, women or, you know, like just <sighs> you have power through something special, through something that brings joy. And to to twist that into something cruel is just it's bullying on a whole nother level that that goes beyond an easy description. So maybe not my favorite, but the most affected chapter mm-hmm. to me. Did you say you had Sorry. another one? Well, I no, did. You're good. <laughs> I, I just wanted one. to make sure that you yeah. had space to talk about it. Harvey. Harvey yeah. was my absolute favorite in a good way. Uh, I lost a friend um, at the beginning of COVID during the, I'm not particularly sure what took him, but he was a much older gent that I met during a production of Harvey and he played the doctor. He was one of the most joyous, special human beings I think I've ever met. And anytime I did any creative things, I would posted on Facebook just for him because he'd always say something awesome. He'd always be like, oh, this was so fun. And at the beginning of COVID, I was working on something and I was trying to be like, oh, maybe I should like use my voice to do this thing. I was very scared. And so he actually passed away during the time I was making it. And I was like, I don't have anyone to post for because uh, I realized that most of that, I, I really did just do it to share with him. And so I, I did it in honor of him. It's, you uh, have an audience for your makeup tutorials. Don't worry. <laughs> it's, which it's so, it's so, it blows my mind, but like, I think it made it easier to just think silly, 
goofy Dwight was there on the other side. And it was not a great name, just the, and, and I knew that it's, he was older. He was like in his seventies or something like that. And that's too young still, but uh, there was always that risk. And mm -hmm. even though all, like all of you are so encouraging and awesome, sometimes we need that like mascot, you know? And he was, he was that mascot. So when I was reading Harvey, I realized that people like him are our Harveys. They're just, even if they're not there in those sad moments when we really need that rabbit following us around being like, it's fine, dude. They'll, you know, you, what they're saying, it's, it's okay. You just keep walking. I'm, I'm here. That sometimes it's a person. Sometimes it's a memory of someone who just accepted you even though you have a lot of people who accept you, right? It, they're right there. Like we're all right here, but sometimes they're just a Harvey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was my favorite chapter because I couldn't stop thinking about that production, which by the way, was also a very hard production because there were some really mean people on it. it, it I had to fight a lot of folk. And so it really stood out how kind uh, Dwight and, and Doug were. <laughs> all right. Sorry. <laughs> I also, I love that chapter too, because I think we're all so afraid to like the idea that to go into like your boss's office and just have a meltdown and be like, I got to quit. And they're just like, mm -hmm. yeah, just take it. And the grace to have someone say, no, just take a couple weeks. And I think a lot of us are really afraid that that's like also really hidden away for so many people is just being, just being able to say safely with acceptance, like I'm not doing all right. <laughs> And I need to go, I need to go figure it out. Admitting that. <laughs> yeah. It's the worst. Well, because I think we all just, no matter how confident we are, we all assume we're going to hear you're a failure. Yeah. Get out of here. We don't want you. Like, of course you're quitting. Like how, you know, you've let us all down. You're never going to get better. That's like the, the existential, the, and then the number of times and like that so many of us, if you take that leap and just say, I can't do it anymore the grace of people is usually really is there more than we know. So we fear each other a lot. Me too. Well, we can be on a couple of weeks ago. If you are any choice to deal with other people, at some point you are choosing to deal with their bullshit. It's, it's true. Everybody's got bullshit. I've got bullshit. You've got bullshit. I, oh, I forgot to put the thing up because I was going to make it easier to censor me. <laughs> I, I didn't have time to write censor on the thing. On my paper. Dang it. Anyway, we should like, do that. That's good. If, if you don't want to, if you're unwilling to deal with people's crap, you have to be alone because you have no other mm -hmm. options and you're going to deal with your own while you're there. Mm -hmm. Always give, you, give yourself time, but yeah, it's hard so everybody's got stuff that you're that they're dealing with that you're dealing with it's hard but you are it's possible and our harvey's help <laughs> and i think a lot of us are really afraid to make that choice even if we do end up with that same rejection and that same bullshit sometimes you have to like i i had to go to rehab shit that was rough that was terrible to tell people it was really hard and it ended up being that's usually the best decision you've ever made for yourself is making the choice in the face of all the risk and all the potential repercussion from all the normal people around you who are also dealing with their own nonsense. If you still turn to that and go, I no longer care if I deal with the negative, the negative impact, I have to take care of myself or I won't make it. That's hard for us too. We, some yeah. people will, they try to just like cram all those things away and just keep going and keep grinding. And sometimes you have to just stop. You have to. So, and yeah, I liked that. That story was really, and very humanizing to like learn. That's a very vulnerable thing for an author to write about and any yeah. person to talk about. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And it was great to see that other side, that, that perspective of, of, like you said, the, the understanding uh, boss. It's, yes. It is rare. It's because the bottom line is so important to so many companies, especially news or like anything that's published. This publishing goes fast. Yeah. So I did not expect that outcome. <laughs> it was really, really wonderful. Yeah. Especially like 20, 25 years ago. Like nowadays, I feel like it's less taboo than it has been to, mm -hmm. to actually take care of yourselves and like encourage people that you work for and work with or that work for you to take care of themselves as well. Just to hear uh, 
like how supportive his that company was it was also like it's like a, a little glint of like oh maybe there is hope for humanity yes. <laughs> like yes. like stories like that are like this is the the ideal like and ideal way to handle the workaholic culture that we're in yeah we're all deep in what does deleterious mean i wrote it down and forgot to look it up deleterious is that how you say it yeah, yeah it's i want to say it's very similar to detrimental but i'm oh i should have yes. put it in context causing harm or damage yeah. ah, thank, you, thank you oxford english dictionary Hooray! <laughs> so wait, how do you say it again? Deleterious. I think you just Dil dropped an E. Deleterious. Or maybe you have another word. There are a lot of words. I should not presume I know which word it is. <laughs> it's what just is my it? best guess. Deleterious. Deleterious. Hmm. Look but it up, Nathan. Can you, Deleterious. can you spell that, Emily? Yes, I can. D E L E T E R. I O U S. <laughs> yeah, that's deleterious. Yep. Dil, dil you're, you're, just, deleterious. you're just shortening the third E to like a. You're you're underemphasizing it way too much. Got it, because it's not an er, it's an er. Like it, you know, like. Ah, uh, oh, English is bonkers. The explanation, <laughs> the thing that the thing I'm looking at has it as basically a hard I, deleterious. I think yeah, I thought it was spelled with an I. Serious. Look at us learning together. Hooray. Yay. <laughs> I don't usually have my phone near me when I read, just so I'm not distracted. Yeah. So then I I write it down, but then yep. I forget. <laughs> yeah. the, speaking of which, this chapter on the notes app was quite funny. Yes. Very on point for this conversation. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Writing in the margins yeah. of books, and then he had a list of all. I love the, I don't know what this meant or who I stole it from. Like, oh, who hasn't been there? Especially oh, yeah. if you're like throw, me and you used to drink a lot. I throw my shopping up, list like, on this book that I had. Notes in my phone and be like, I guess that was probably <laughs> funny at the time. What does this mean? I don't know. Yes, the shopping list. My Great. dreams. The the jokes that I think of in my dreams that I write down and I'm <laughs> hilarious and I read in the morning. I'm like, this is the worst thing I've ever had. <laughs> Oh my god. Ah, that's so funny. I wrote down it's like bathroom facts with a personal twist. That's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you were to write a topic, what topic would it be? Oh. And what rating? You? Oh, New I, Vegas. I had thought of a thing. New Vegas. That's yes, good. Probably. Or um maybe uh something like our our sense of smell and talk about yeah, because I do so much sensory and tasting and uh, just how how we engage with smell and how we lo we put it so far down the list of priorities. Like when we talk about like, oh, if I lost a sense, like losing your sight or your hearing or your ability to speak are, are always important, and but which is true. But our sense of smell is pretty incredible for how we function and how it allows us to interact with the world in such unique ways. So I wrote a paper on that, actually. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, I'd love to read it. Yeah. I will send it to you. It yeah. was, but yeah, it, it, I never had thought about it until then. Yeah. What, oh, what do you rate it? Uh, I think I have to rate smell. I give it a, I give it a, a four. Get, get Remember, you can smell everything. So that's also yes. a problem. You so can't I don't know if you have time. kids and I don't know if you've dealt with the first couple of years of that. And then <laughs> the next couple of years. And then it's okay for a while. And then it gets bad again. I'm going to say it's probably not the same parallel, but having grown up uh, mucking stalls and with cats in various stages of digestive control, I think I'm like, I'm close. Not quite baby human level. I'll, I'll own to that, but. No, I think I, I kind of like horrible dumpster smells too, though. Like uh, putting your head over a wine tank that's fermenting and reeling your head back and being like, why, why am I transported to the dumpster outside the Chipotle that I walk by? I'm like, what's, cool? like, what's happening with this fermentation? I think just, I give it a four out of five just for the sheer fact that smell gives us so much information. Uh, it gets knocked down one just because they're stinky things. But it tells Perfect. us a lot about what's happening. I think it's fast. True. It warns us. Yes. About a... Uh... You lads. Although, oh, did you, sorry, one fact about smell. I think he mentions it in this book that they, because natural gas used to be, uh, odor, is obviously naturally odorless. And then they made it smell like rotting eggs. And there was like, 
what the hell happened in the book where there was they had to stop doing that because there were so many 911 calls? I'm so sorry. This is not a complete thought. Somebody yeah, else will yeah. find it. You know what I'm talking That's about, though? Right? I remember what, yeah. And it made me laugh. Oh, because they, well, also that they, oh, no, wait. I'm remembering this strangely with the fact that they purposely poisoned alcohol. Was that in this book or was that something I was reading that, at the time? Was I was something reading else. This book? Like, something that's a thing that did <laughs> happen in the Prohibition era. Yes. But... Why am I don't... connecting that? I must have read it right when I was reading that chapter then. Oh, yeah, I'm but... so sorry. I thought this was a complete thought and it, it isn't. Anyway, smell is amazing. Someone else go. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think the, the a fun one I would do is probably gaff tape just because oh like gosh, yes. gaff tape is so useful, which I would, I think I'd give gaff tape four out of five stars. Um, because like pull it up sometimes. Exactly. And sometimes <laughs> like if it's been baking in the sun, it will leave residue on the stage. They didn't have to clean. Um, but then I think like a more like serious one, probably music and the power of like listening to music, <sighs> like especially this, this past the, during the pandemic, like I spent a lot of time, like really getting back into like new types of music. And it really helped mm. me get through just because, music like any kind of art is very like while like the artist has like an intention creating it well usually uh it also <laughs> means different things to different people that hear it and so like there are like comforting songs that like i've listened to throughout the time even just um npr did a pen <coughs> bless you so uh, sorry. that's okay uh npr did uh a podcast early on called coronavirus daily and that was like my regular thing and just the introductory music it was just like slow guitar but it was like it was really beautiful and so even every now and then like they don't use that intro anymore because they changed the name of the podcast but i still will go back to that first episode sometimes just like to if i like i'm like doom spiraling or something about like the, like the pandemic or something i'll do that to kind of like ground me and like you got we got through all of this uh we're, we've got a lot more to get through but uh and that was kind of a non sequitur in multiple different directions with that but i think uh music you in general that to you yeah mm. exactly <laughs> also that would fit in perfectly in this book so yes, yes <laughs> really would and music i'd probably give four or four and a half stars because there are things like nickelback out there <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> Throw that shade. Ooh. And I have, a, don't I, I have an entire Obi-Wan rant on Nickelback. Don't. Ooh. <laughs> oh no, no, no. no. <laughs> it's a weirder enough. rant than you. Well, you would expect. Maybe the the other two of you wouldn't necessarily know uh-huh. me well enough to expect or to see <laughs> that one coming. Nathan <laughs> would be happy though. So. <laughs> oh boy, Eric. What about you? What chapters are you writing? I hard four. Oh. Wait, what's that? The movie? The fourth one? Die Hard? Oh, oh Die, Die Hard! hard. I, I, Die I was hard wondering if my mic maybe dropped out a little bit. Die I Hard had oh. Die Hard 4, oh my god. I, I assume everybody's seen it? I did in theaters. Oh, <laughs> I've oh wait, wait, hold on. One. We're talking about the 4th of July one? Yes. Okay, not the Valentine's Day one. That was the fifth one, right? There was a Valentine's there's I don't remember bad. the fifth one because it was uh-huh. incredible trash. So, it was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually really liked. What would yeah. what would you star it? Well, that it's it's not the overall because it's actually because you have to deal on the one side with how it's a problem in the context of both its series and movies because it's Die Hard. The first Die Hard, one of the great things about it was how it grounded action movies. It wasn't Schwarzenegger like hip firing a machine gun at six people with zero cover and just like killing them all. <laughs> That's a good it point. It was, he gets, he gets slowly like dirty and then he gets, you know, he does the glass in the feet and he, by the end, he's just like stumbling to the end of the movie and that's all he has left. Green and then like name. over the course of the series, it gets, it kind of loses that and four has some very cartoony <laughs> level stuff in it. The helicopter it, it, scene. Wait, was uh, I was thinking was more bad? about the part where he fell onto an F-35 that's, and that's then the fell off the F-35 onto concrete, which is at like a 60 degree angle. <laughs> no, that's not. No, 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 no. You'd be dead. Um, 
So, like, on the one hand, it has this huge move towards, like, what's a problem in action movies in general and what, and like, the problems that would create the fifth terrible movie. Mm-hmm. And it has one scene in the middle that I like more than any other thing in any other action movie, which is him driving in a car with Justin Long. <laughs> you, and I don't even, and I'm going to guess nobody here even remembers what happens with it. No. Justin Long, like at this point, like they're, this is like two thirds of the way through the movie. And Justin Long is just like, ha- uh, is like zonked out. Like he's a conscious, but he's out of it. And he's like, you know, you, no more, you know, you, your mouth stopped working. What's going on? And he's like, can't deal with this. I'm not, her- I'm not heroic like you. And it's, uh, hold on. Nobody's hero kid. You know what you get for a hero? Uh, being a hero? A pat on the back. Uh, good job. Blah, blah, blah. Your wife divorces you. Your kids don't remember your name. You, went, it's a lot, you get to eat a lot of meals by yourself. Why are you doing? Then why are you doing this? Because there's nobody else to do it right now. So we're going to do it. If, they, if there was somebody else, I would let them. Hmm. But there's not. And it needs to be done, so that's what we're going to do. So it is good. a dramatic, it is a very simple philosophical, like it's it's removing almost all philosophical analysis to like its most basic level. We have a thing that needs doing, we're just going to do it. And that's, I, I really enjoyed that. And then like a bunch of stuff blows. <laughs> yes. yes. Four I stars. forgot about that scene. Yeah, it's a beautiful scene. I liked that there was Thank that component of this up. book, too, that has, like, it could be something, like, that he talks about the mountain goats. I don't know. But that it's like there was this really nice level of self-indulgence. Like, I do think we all probably should write our own chapter at some point. Mine we would should. just, like, about something that we're so passionate about don't care if anyone else feels the same way i like that there was that level of modesty too but mm. i would love to read your review of this Die Hard 4 scene yes awesome uh, also for me it's editing i just it's oh, yeah. such a relaxing kind of it, it's a special thing for me because it's the only part of my brain i feel hasn't broken at this point and i can still see connections and like where something should be and it's a it's a very special moment between just me and whatever i'm editing four out of four four stars four stars <laughs> only loses one star because you have to sit that way <laughs> the stress of never knowing if i'll quite do it <gasps> okay yeah it it works out but yeah well, that's a good scene love that i i can't wait for zeal to watch all of the diehards watch the that <laughs> progression towards the uh absurd <laughs> the dumpster fire five yes <laughs> i've only seen the first one so maybe i should join the deal yes yes we're gonna second, watch two second one person. downhill third one back up again four third is kind of in the middle say again I, th- I completely agree third was fantastic uh four was just fun it wasn't like a die hard movie it was just a good action movie we need that oh, which too. rating would you change of his yeah oh Maybe some one star geese rather than two. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. There were some threes in there that I would have argued. What did he give CNN? I'd probably change that two. one. <laughs> two and a half, I think. Two. He gave it a two. Two. Okay. I wrote it down. <laughs> so, oh, that's great. Oh, that's so much better than my notes. It, it's it was much faster than your notes. It was much easier. <laughs> <laughs> I do kind of overdo some things. I don't know. I There were some that I think I went, oh, my experience with that would probably be different, but I felt like they were such a rating on his experience. Like there was it not on the thing time. itself. So I yeah. I was like, well, you're not wrong. It's like, I think the Bonneville salt, salt Flats probably are not as horrifying as you say they are, but I don't know. I haven't been. Uh, I think they sound pretty cool, but <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Such a rating on the life lived and not the, the mm. item itself. Oh, I want to know what color paint you guys would put on the baseball <laughs> and then i have to watch the time because i have to start a movie in my discord oh, oh yes shoot oh wow that's so fast yeah 
time flies when you have great conversation with amazing people. It is true. It's true. You know what? I agree. I agree. It was such a personal experience. I don't. I, I love that question yeah. though. Yeah. I, 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 even, I was curious. Even thinking like, uh, cause the only reason why I was good, uh, why I would even consider changing CNN's rating to lower is because of the way 24 hour news sits like really poisoning the way people consume news. But at the same time, like the way that he framed it, talking about like the history of CNN and like that there are redeemable parts of all of the 24 hour well most of the 24 hour networks i'm sure there could be an argument made that some of them are not uh yeah. but and like but even like uh what b was saying like it's so much from his own experience like who am i to change the rating of his experience it's not mine to to change yeah i hadn't thought of that angle also, I would like all of us to go to the Indianapolis 500 someday. <laughs> <laughs> Please come visit. We'll ride bikes. That sounded really fun. <laughs> Honestly, yes. Especially with us in racing games. <laughs> when I want to get into something like that easier. I live in a college town and they tailgate. You don't even have to watch the game. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I hated that. Those Same. drives. Probably a little easier than getting to Indianapolis. Mm, it's only two cool. hours for me. So I've got an advantage, you get, but you'd all have to come visit and then we can yes. go together. Deal. <laughs> uh, conceptually, I thought it was really interesting. The individual power we have within the Anthropocene, uh, whether by observ observation or uh, participation. That's my summary of the book. <laughs> yeah. I, I really like to focus on you how powerful humans are how much we can change and then how we get in over our heads with our inability to correct and fix uh and so there should maybe be more focus on let's emphasize a little more peace a little more listening a little more staying put a little more being and not quite so much competition and uh progression progress more mm. care um and more love always good <laughs> I liked his. I enjoyed his focus on how not everything is how you deal with it, less than it is what it is itself. He talks about particularly. I'll point out the bit about Mario Kart, where it's almost not at all about Mario Kart. It's about the time that he spent playing Mario Kart with other people and why that is something that matters to him. Amen. <laughs> We're all staring at you, Nathan. I don't. I don't have anything else to add. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. <laughs> oh, am I supposed to wrap it up? <laughs> Is that what you're staring at me for? I, I, I was. Uh, no, I just didn't want to. I wanted to make sure that if you had like a, a closing thought, we knew it. Although you've been excellent at sharing your thoughts on it, as a overall. <laughs> Cool. Well, yeah. actually, hang on. Do, do you all have a star rating for the book? <gasps> oh, that's good. Five stars. Five stars. Wow. Yeah. It came I'm, to me I'm at the right time. This is good. I'd, oh. I'd probably pull it back to four. But then, to be clear, oh, where is it? <laughs> a book. A book club I used to be in really changed my scaling for what constitutes a good or bad book because I voluntarily purchased this. What's that? A that coder? is Tree of Codes. Don't read it. Don't look it up. It's mm -hmm. trash. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So <laughs> I read some really bad books there. That, that one takes the cake. Wow. Oh, wow. That's impressive. I, my, I have this problem where my history was I read a lot of classics or really highly regarded books. So I had a very small number of actually bad books. So I would have called this a three and they changed my scaling. This book is clearly at least four. Cool. <laughs> I've read a lot of 60s sci-fi. So four for me. <laughs> uh, oh, I give it four because it really made me think. <laughs> you can really dance to it. So... <laughs> I, I agree with B. I'd, I'd give it a five as well. I think that it is like the the way that I I see it, just like it's accepting the flaws it may have as 
but inherently human and like that is beautiful but also nice. it's really thought provoking and was like also a well needed or well timed for me to read it now as well sometimes it just comes to you at the right moment mm -hmm. yeah oh, all right cool guys i'm gonna end the recording but uh thank you thank you all so much oh this was wonderful yes that's right pick up a copy uh local library also this one is signed too because he signed like a gajillion yeah. of them. It, <laughs> his brother his brother did a vlog did you, that said wait did that, you read the the review for the signature yes oh, yeah. the review for the signature was, yeah he yeah. talks about it uh right in the front oh the right, right, right right yes 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 and, and his brother said that this is the only book that loses value being signed <laughs> and ups value not being signed. More. <laughs> oh, that's so funny, though. That's oh, my. It makes me like it more. That's now I'm in All right. recording. Goodbye, right. recording.